Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, we are, I think, very happy, all of us, to be here. I am uh, very happy now to be with uh, Dr. Anwar Gargash, who, uh, after an uh, extremely distinguished uh, career as university professor, uh, international law and international relations, and more than uh, 10 years uh, serving as uh, Secretary of, S of State of the Emirates, very well known abroad as the uh, Emirates Kissinger, if I can say so, is now the uh, Special Diplomatic uh, Advisor to the President of the uh, Emirates and the um, uh, the, 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 the diplomatic institute uh, uh, here bears his name since, which is a, a unique uh, honor. I know, Anwar, that it's a bit embarrassing for you, but it is the Anwar Gargash Diplomatic Institute of the uh, uh, Emirates. Uh, and if you allow me, uh, we are friends. And uh, this uh, conference would never have taken place uh, in Abu Dhabi, as it is the case these, day, these days, if uh, we had not uh, discussed about this possibility and about many, many uh, other subjects, all kinds of subjects, uh, from geopolitics, but other things as well, and if we had not done all that over the last uh, two years. So it's a great uh, privilege uh, uh, to have you uh, with us today. And uh, I will start immediately the, the discussion with a, a simple, a broad, simple uh, question. Well, in the last two years, actually, since uh, we started to talk about the possibility of having the conference here, the world has changed in a major or in several major ways. Obviously, the pandemic, which is not over yet by far. We had uh, interesting sessions this morning on the subject, but uh, also the acceleration of the Sino-US uh, 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 rivalry, uh, the new president uh, of the United States, the Afghan uh, withdrawal, more recently uh, uh, the uh, shock for uh, some of uh, what is called now AUKUS, etc., etc. So my question is very simple. How do you assess all these major, uh, the, the, the consequences of these major changes on the uh, regional uh, geopolitical situation? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Terry. Thank you for the kind words. And I'm, I'm really happy and pleased to be here. I see many friends, so I say hello to all of them and wishing you all a good conference. I, I would say that, uh, you know, to start the conversation and from the perspective here in the Gulf, from the UAE, uh, we really are seeing several dimensions to the changes in the international system. I think on the one hand, the pandemic makes it very, very clear that our geostrategic priorities need not only be political priorities, but our geostrategic priorities can be about other issues. These other issues is, as we've seen, the pandemic with all its effect on the economy, on people's lives, on working habits, etc. And I think this brought uh, to the UAE, like I'm sure many other countries, a reorientation of priorities. Suddenly for us in the UAE priorities uh, that were important, but perhaps not as persistent, such as, for example, food security, the logistic chain, and so on and so forth, became extremely important. I think this dimension of the international system is something that we need to concentrate on and not allow the politicians to forget it because concentrating on it brings about what I would say positive change rather than going back to the old ways. So I would say that on one level, 
the non-political priorities taking precedence over the political priorities, something that is totally unprecedented and new. We might have had moments in the international system where this was the case, but certainly nothing in our current media, in our current way we live, where, how we travel, etc., has been affected uh, by this. And I can tell you that the UAE, uh, through its very concerted effort to deal with uh, with, uh, with COVID-19 has learned many lessons. Now, I think the important thing is that our memory should be longer rather than shorter on this issue, whether here in the UAE or whether in other areas. So I think that is the first thing. I think the second uh, important issue is the multipolar nature of the political system. I mean, clearly, this has been an ongoing uh, phase in the international system. The international system has witnessed, after the fall of the Soviet Union, a very brief American moment. Although the United States remains predominant and most important, but clearly the international system is not unipolar. What we have very clearly today is the presence of China. And that presence of China, economic, technological, in many regions in the world, political, I think will stay with us. I think we are all worried very much by uh, a looming Cold War. And I think for countries like all of us here present really in this hall, uh, that is bad news for all of us. Because the idea of choosing is problematic in the international system. And I think we, this is not going to be an easy ride, but clearly China will continue to become extremely important. Now, it is sometimes easier uh, to understand America's direction than China's direction because of the nature of the debate and the openness of the debate. So while America's a direction is something that you can glean from uh, various uh, readings and conferences and discussions. Understanding China's direction, I think, is more opaque. But fundamentally, I think this is going to be a big challenge for all of us. Uh, for us here in the UAE, the United States is our predominant strategic partner, but China is our number one or two with India uh, economic partner. And I don't think the issue is only about America and China. I mean, if you look at our country, the UAE uh, has what I would call core economic and strategic relations with India, with Korea, with Japan, and all these three countries have their own rivalry and problems with China. So it's not only recalibrating Chinese-American relations or American-Chinese relations, but I think it is also recalibrating many other relations. India, for example, is our <clears throat> closest large neighbor or largest neighbor. And India is in competition with China and how much trade we're making. And India is in, on the ascendancy also at the same time. And I think for a country like us, our size, uh, we are very concerned about this looming uh, Cold War, and I hope that we don't get to that, although realistically all the signals are not very encouraging. I think on the third level, which is the regional level, the regional level, and this is directing a lot of our uh, current foreign policy and policy movement, the, re the region is, uh, is not much better currently than it was two years ago. I think the areas of potential, uh, potential confrontation <clears throat> have not become less. So it will need actually from all of us uh, an understanding, number one, that confrontation is not the way forward uh, and 
communication is the way forward. It doesn't mean that we will be able to change Iran's perception of its role in the region or Turkey's perception of its role in the region or how we see the Arab world and how it should come back to uh, a more lively uh, regional uh, system. But at the same time, I think we need to also understand that it is extremely important that we avoid confrontations. And even though the road towards communication is longer and frustrating, we really have no other option. Well, thank you very much. I think that uh, this point of, uh, for most countries which are represented in this uh, room, uh, the, the, the problem of avoiding to be forced to choose is uh, really a, a fundamental uh, concern. And uh, many uh, of us, including, including, for instance, the members of NATO, uh, consider, as you said, the U.S. is more predictable than China because we know more about the U.S., but uh, the direction clearly is that they will try to force us to choose, for instance, to transform the Atlantic Alliance into an anti-Chinese alliance, even if the whales are not uh, used. So it is a very big challenge. But for the Middle East and the Gulf in particular, it seems to me that there are two uh, op apparently opposite trends, because of, on the one hand, they should logically try to push you to take sides. But on the other hand, there is another trend, which is to the withdrawal <laughs> or the partial withdrawal from the Middle East, which uh, paved the way for uh, more uh, active policies on the part of Russia and Turkey, for instance. So how would you balance uh, these, uh, in analytical terms, these two trends, uh, one pushing you to take sides and the other one getting more, becoming more uh, indifferent, if I can use uh, that word. Well, I, I think we have <clears throat> several problems here. I think the first one is we really have no Arab discussion on all these things. So really everyone is on his own, except for bilateral discussions, perhaps we will have with Egypt or with Saudi Arabia as two of our closest uh, friends. But in general, I think uh, the Arab uh, political system uh, has decayed really over the past decade or two that these important issues uh, need to be discussed. And I think they have not been discussed, any of these issues that we have uh, we've spoken about. So that I think is a problem. I would say that we have to also uh, understand that the United Arab Emirates is a medium-sized country in its political gravitas, <clears throat> in its economic weight. So we really have no option except explaining ourselves, communicating, making sure that, you know, for example, using our time in the UN Security Council in the next two years to ensure that a rules-based political system is the one that governs this international system. I don't think we uh, can definitely uh, change course of the big players here, the United States or China. But I think communication is extremely important. If there are concerns and worries, we need to address them. If, uh, as you understand also, that at times this political uh, cold wars or confrontations are done with very little thought. They are done with very little thought, positions are taken, and it's only later that people start really rethinking their thought uh, process on it. So I would say that we need to uh, communicate with our partners and friends. We need <coughs> to emphasize the rules-based international system because it's in our interest as it is in the interest of everybody else. Yet, you raise something extremely important, and this is really about the presence and commitment in the Middle East. 
And I think Afghanistan is a big test. We will see in the coming period, really, what is going on with regards to uh, America's footprint in the region. I don't think we know yet, but Afghanistan is definitely a test. And to be honest, it's a very worrying test. I think Europe is different because the United States uh, has more of an internationalist view and an Atlanticist view and a NATO view on Europe. So, and, 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 and the Far East is different because the United States also is seeing that tilt to the Far, far East. So you have this gray area in the, in the middle. And I think part of what we need to do is manage our region better. Because as I said, there is a vacuum. And whenever there is a vacuum, there is trouble. So it is extremely essential for us that we avoid vacuums. It is extremely essential for us to talk, to communicate, and to understand also that in talking, communicating, it does not necessarily mean that we will change certain policies, but that we do need this, this de-escalation. So I see that as a major issue. But w when you say us, us is, you say sometimes the Arab world, sometimes the Middle East, sometimes the Gulf countries. Can you elaborate a little bit? Who is us? Well, I think the, the us using it in these different things tells you what sort of issue that we have here. I hope, I hope, I hope that, uh, you know, I think we start with the national state because to be honest, I don't really see the level of collective openness and collective discussion beyond the nation state. But we need to push that forward. We need to come and say these levels of analysis are changing the international system. And because they are changing the international system, it is too big for any single country really to address where its place in this international system should be. I don't think it is seeking to challenge anybody. I think it is about securing this area where a lot of people see half of the issues of the world emanating from, and some people say we've wasted too much blood and treasure on it, and let us move on. Because I think the Middle East will not let you go away. I mean, that is really the lesson from the Middle East. You might want to go uh, away from it, but the Middle East will not let you away either through national issues or thematic issues. So I think that is a major issue. Uh, uh, another easy uh, question, uh, you uh, stressed uh, rule-based uh, international system. But uh, last time uh, Xi Jinping went to Davos, he appeared as the great defender of the rule-based system. The problem is who sets, uh, not the rules, but the changes of the rule. So today, the, the, the great challenge is that the Chinese, to take the, the example of the Chinese and, and, the, and the US, do not share the same view about what the rule should be. So, uh, so how, could you, how do you think that through communication and, and all the moves you are describing, do you think that as we, we, that is the in-between, uh, can uh, work, cooperate to, to to, 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 to have a certain uh, real weight uh, on, on how the rules will be adapted. The rules have to be adapted when the world changes. So I think this is a very good question. I think to start on a conceptual level, you have in the Biden administration, an administration that actually comes and says, I want a rule-based international system. The Chinese are saying the same. The Europeans definitely uh, are also arguing for that. I think it's in the interest of countries like us in the Arab world and in other areas in Africa and Asia to call for that. So I think conceptually there is an agreement on this religion, this rule-based international system. Now I think drilling down, as you said, is the problem. And I think here we need to be a little bit, we need to speak out. We need to come and say, the world is not ready for another Cold War. And I think if this message comes across to the Chinese, to the Americans, and to others, I think this will in itself create what I would so call a moral collective. 
And I think this moral, moral collective will be something very, very positive. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I'm saying, what is the other option? Is it to allow the international system to go into its current trajectory and end up where we're all afraid where it will end up without too much thought, without too much control? Uh, or is it something where we can all come collectively and say, uh, it is in our interest, we understand that there is a big confrontation coming for international uh, system dominance. But let us at least try and control this uh, trajectory. I don't know if that answers the question. You, you, you know, uh, Anwar, because we have discussed that so many times that the real purpose of the World Policy Conference is precisely to develop this kind of uh, dialogue uh, that is the, the in-between world, that is all the middle powers who are not the superpowers of the day. And uh, therefore our challenge is precisely to elaborate on these sort of things. So now, uh, after having spoken of us or we, I would like to enlarge slightly the concept of us or we to include explicitly Europe. So uh, and by Europe, let's, let us restrict ourselves in the first step to the, to, to the European Union. Uh, while I say that, I am hesitating because I'm th thinking, of course, also of the UK, which makes it uh, slightly uh, more difficult. But nevertheless, what do you uh, expect uh, from, from us as being this time the Europeans? Well, I, again, I would say two things here. I would say, number one, the collective European policy should be more pragmatist and more realistic. In my opinion, uh, Europe, because it's so many countries, has not always been able to produce what I would say cohesive collective policies. But I think looking from here towards Europe, I think the voices of pragmatism should be the main voices. What is possible rather than what is uh, a very high ceiling that's never reachable. I think that is extremely important. I think this will depend a lot on the Franco-German uh, you know, cooperation and synergy over the coming two, three years. Is this going to produce uh, a more realistic, cohesive policy? I mean, again, if you look at our policy here as the UAE, uh, on the bilateral level, we're doing very well. We're doing very well with France, we're doing very well with the UK, uh, and many other European countries. But the issue is, collectively, I think there is a huge gap between uh, a, a policy that's propagated and a policy that is ready to apply uh, on the ground. And I think uh, reducing that gap uh, will be very good, not only for Europe, but also for Europe's traditional uh, partners such, uh, such as ours. I think that is extremely uh, important for us. We also look at the recent rift, for example, between Paris and Washington. And, and we're not happy with these things because we would also like to see more cohesion among our traditional partners uh, because we don't really want to play one partner against the other because our partnerships are, uh, are extremely uh, different. But I think that is extremely important. A more real politic, pragmatist approach from Europe, I think, is required in the coming period.